today to speak to the foreign press. Um, we were having a lot of questions for you because to be honest, you know, it's a surprising candidacy, first of all, and I know that you get a lot of attention from the media and it's also a great honor for us to have you here, given the fact that you are so busy in terms of a series of interviews and a media presence, which is very, very strong and powerful. But I have some questions for you and I hope that we will resolve during the interview. I would like to thank you again on behalf of our audience for being here. Uh, most of the people and particularly the journalists who cover the UN are know, knowing you, knowing your resume, that you are raised and born in, in India, that you are uh, the daughter of uh, refugees, you lived in Saudi Arabia, you have been an, an, an auditor at the UN, so you have experience working in the UN. Um, and I would like also to explore things that we don't know about you. So if you are ready, we can start. Yes. Um, so I think I'll just probably start by saying I am so honored and humbled to be here uh, with you. Uh, I think I'll probably start with a story that I haven't shared on camera before. My respect for the profession of journalism, the trade it is. Um, I've, uh, I came to the U.S. after Trump was elected. So, like, you know, the America that I've seen is, is that Trump's American. Over the last four years, we've heard so much fake news, fake news, fake news, and I had never experienced uh, any interactions with journalism. So when I announce my candidacy, I've been exposed to a lot of journalists. I have acquired an immense amount of respect for journalists, to be honest with you, because uh, they are um, the messenger of truth, messenger of different voices to the world. And I've also seen that how um, they have actually audited me. Every time I say something, they've asked for like, can you show the backup documents for this? Can you show where you got the numbers from? They've actually verified it with me. So I um, am just so glad that, I, that I've been able to understand more about your profession, have a respect for it. And with that, I've actually become a very generous uh, donator contributor to anyone who says we are free publication, please donate. I'm like, I will do my part. In, in making sure journalism is alive. So I think that's my opening remark to say that's, I am. That's a um, great point because also my, my, my view is that if we want to secure and to reassure the independence of journalism, I truly believe that media organizations probably even, they need to change the, the nature of the business model to become non-profit business model so they can be relying on donations and contributions from independent donors and not necessarily through private sector uh, advertisements, which creates, to some extent, some sort of, you know, engagement with specific branded content. Um, and I would like to ask you, how do you see, how do you experience all of this, you know, uh, since you announced your, your candidacy, how do you experience this adventure of being on media, interacting with um, journalists, being on, TV talk shows, giving interviews. I assume that was something completely new to you, given you know your career background, which is, I would say, more potentially uh, internal, uh, inner. If I'm right. Yeah, absolutely. You're right. My my profession never required me to be in front of media. I um, never even had a social media account on any platform: Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. So for me, all this was new for the purpose of the candidacy. And it has been a very um, fruitful experience where I enjoy having conversations with journalists, hearing their experiences, sharing about the UN. And I think one thing that I've uh, really enjoyed uh, sharing with journalists and the world is that there are two UNs that a lot of people didn't know about. We only know UN from the decision-making point of view, Security Council, General Assembly, and Economic and Social Commission. But there's a whole UN underneath that is made up of 100 entities, almost more than $50 billion in budget, and um, headed by the Secretary General. So I think it's interesting that there is an appetite to have conversations about that UN, to learn, and to move together towards a UN that, that serves the world after COVID. So it's... a uh, Mm -hmm. Do you think that the body of the UN, even, you know, the executives, the leaders on behalf of the different countries, the staff, do you think that the whole body is ready at this moment to 
get into a conversation about deep reforms, more transparency, more accountability, more effectiveness? Um, so the decision making bodies have been trying to have conversations around reforms and transparency for almost seven decades now. Uh, th the current secretary general is the ninth secretary general and we've had eight reforms of the UN. So there have been constant discussions and requests by member states to reform to make it more transparent. The challenge is that we haven't achieved any of the results of those reforms. And that is what I think this time member states are very keen to ensure that after COVID, we don't go back to old ways of doing things. COVID has exposed us to inequalities that we knew existed, but the disparity is more significant even in developed countries than we knew. So um, countries are absolutely on board that we need a UN that works. And something else that I'm sure member states have also reflected is that UN is not even able to meet their needs. Forget meeting people's needs, which we know they're not. Even member states' needs are not being met. COVAX, which is a program that's supposed to provide vaccines to everyone, uh, to the countries um, uh, that are part of it, 143. According to current estimates, the COVAX vaccine will get in most countries by 2024. That is not some a service that even member states want. Four of the member states have uh, gotten out of it and signed their own deals. So um, there is a huge demand for a UN that functions all parts of society, member states, the general public, and civil society as well, private sector as well. What was, let's go back to the, how we started this conversation about your decision to announce your candidacy. What were the first reactions you received from the members of your family, from your social circle, your friends, when they learned and they heard about your decision? And first of all, who was the first person that you shared your thinking, your thoughts of, of running before even you make it public? Um, so I think the first person I shared was my mother in January 2019. So the reforms concluded in December 2018. I was on it for two years and I was uh, so heartbroken that they ended up being a reshuffle like the previous reforms. Um, so my mother was one of the first persons I told that I really want to uh, change the system and run for secretary general. And she was so supportive that I was pleasantly surprised. <laughs> I was like, Did you hear what I just said? And she's like, yeah, yeah, I think it's a great idea. And it's interesting because then in February, just the week before I was about to announce, I told my mom, she's like, oh my God, I thought you were joking. I was like, that is so funny. Why would you think that? But anyhow, it was, uh, so it was interesting that I think at that time inadvertently, I didn't realize, but her affirmative support really was, um, was quite important to me that I knew that my family was with me. In terms of my friends, I have to tell you, um, I've come from private sector. So I have friends in the private sector over my time at the UN, I've made friends uh, in the UN system. So I have shared uh, my concern that the UN is not serving people. So when I share my concerns with, uh, when I've shared my concern with colleagues at the UN, I've received almost two types of responses. They're like, ah, oh, you know, this is what it is, you know, whatever, put your head down, do your job. Or I've received like, you know, the system is not for you, you're so unhappy, you must leave. So I've kind of received these, uh, these options, but there has so there's no shock in what I have to say that the system is not working. They completely know. When it comes to talking to my private sector friends, I've I share with them my concerns, and they're like, "Oh my God, we did not know this is what UN is doing." So to them, what I have to share about the UN is a shock, but my action to run for the position of Secretary General to bring about change is not a shock. So it's just interesting. And to the UN, the shock is that I'm not I'm not accepting this is the best UN can do. So my reaction is a shock. And um, and it's interesting. But um, I think my family support, of course, means a lot to me. I think that's the foundation I um, I was able to uh, to build my campaign on mentally. Uh, this response after I've announced my the employees, my colleagues, uh, they're actually very thrilled. I receive email from them almost daily to say, good job, thank you so much for all the great work you're doing. We know it's not easy, but thanks. Um, I've had a few conversations with uh, member states as well, and even they realize that I'm on the right path. Um, so it's uh, it's quite interesting. And I think just the momentum that it's ga garnered in my generation to say, wow, we don't have to wait for 50 or 60 to seek top positions. We don't have to wait for X number of years to solve a problem, we can try the journey now. So it's. Um, Do you think that your example for for running 
um, for Secretary General. Do you think that your example signifies something for in a broader scale, in a broader spectrum about the fact that there are no barriers of what age you are, there are no bi barriers of what is your origin, what is your gender. Uh, is this something that you would like to symbolize with your action as well? Truthfully, my gender, my age should not even be a discussion point if you think about it, because that is almost discrimination, right? Discrimination on the basis of uh, things that I cannot control. I cannot control my age. I cannot control my gender. Um, so, and, and I think I'm, this I'm is talking about the subconscious. No, I totally, no, no, no. I'm with you. I'm with you on that, that I, I know that you are representing the voices that are um, like, it's not your words. The conservative uh, part yeah. of the society <laughs> of someone who is watching you on TV and saying, or even as someone watching you on TV from another country where the society is so okay. conservative and they are not in the current trend of the Western world. No, I, I, I totally am with you, Tana. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to say that those are your words. I, I just no. meant to say that um, that we should be having a conversation uh, more around what should the future UN be? What should the new UN be? How do we bring representation um, of different ideas um, on the table? But you're right, it's quite unfortunate that um, I'm facing discrimination at three levels. First, as a woman, like, you know, to prove in a man's world that I belong, I'm equal is a hurdle. And God willing, if I'm able to pass that hurdle, then the second hurdle is my age. To even convince people that I have the relevant experience to make a difference. We bring new new ideas and fresh perspective, which the organization has um, needs right now. For 75 years, we've given the profile to one type of um, leader, all men, all in politics and what results have you achieved are we proud of the un that we have today like is the un of today serving anyone so why are we not open to change uh being an employee a professional is of course looked down upon by politicians because they think that um, their experience is what's valuable which is what it's interesting that my experience is what's needed right now because the role of secretary general is the chief administrative officer as defined in our charter. So it is a doer's role. And to be a doer, you need to have come from the ranks to see how do you, how do soldiers do the work before you become a general. Um, so I think it's such relevant perspective. And that's the way I see my role that all I can do is educate and inform them. And that is the foundation of diplomacy, right? It's interesting that I, um, that one of the critiques they have is that I don't have diplomacy experience. And to me, diplomacy is not really a title. Diplomacy is a way of behaving, which is that cooperation, kindness, respect for all. That is diplomacy. And that's what I bring to the table, that I want to have a conversation with them. Whatever their decision, they can express that at the voting stage, member states. They don't have to express that uh, right now because that is discriminatory. So um, all I can do is educate people and pave way for my generation, my gender, and my experience profile that seek the position that um, that you feel you uh, you want to make the change that you want to see yeah, in the world. Yeah, absolutely. I really feel that you pave the way for the future. And if you are not successful now, let's say as a scenario, you certainly make a great beginning for you and for the rest of the generation and for the organization itself of the UN. because. My personal opinion is that your example familiarizes the conservative minds, which exist even in the UN, that a woman at your age, with your background, is not legitimate to run for general secretary. This has been a belief internally to many people, and I think that you break this barrier by your presence. Absolutely. I think whenever pe people see something different, um, it's hard for them to accept it initially. Like, you know, I mean, do you, um, I was just on an Instagram live chat with someone, uh, Chandana Hiran, who filed a lawsuit in India against Fair and Lovely because of their discriminatory practice of promoting beauty that's fair. And I think that's what uh, we have to challenge, that all the preconceived notions that there is that one perfect has to be challenged. And, mm -hmm. and you're right, like, I think for um, my candidacy, that's what is a challenge to member states to accept that there are so many of us out there who are equally talented to make a difference and deserve to be heard. For those who don't know, including myself, what are the resources that your candidacy is needing right now in order to have the prospect of success? 
What is your campaign strategy internally? What are the steps you need to follow to make sure that you will increase as much as possible the possibilities of success? Um, so the first step is to secure a nomination from a member state. Uh, the process is, um, I think the process is a bit unfair that only they are the ones who are allowed to propose a name on the ballot. So you can't, uh, you can't put yourself out there and have a proper primaries like every country has, like you have proper primaries, but here uh, they are the ones who are, who can nominate you. So once you, I get a nomination, then I go through the Security Council and General Assembly. So I am doing my part in reaching out to all member states to have uh, a conversation around my candidacy. Not everyone has responded. And uh, beyond an email and a second follow-up, uh, I'm not sure what I can do. So in terms of resources, I would ask the world to help me with this. And all I ask is a, fair, a free and fair election where I'm allowed to present my candidacy. No matter... The outcome of the candidacy, of course, is in the hands of member states. They can express their decision at the voting stage, but the nomination should be open and my voice um, should be given a seat at the table to present my candidacy. And it would only make UN better to evaluate someone on where they have, like, you know, on what this current secretary general has achieved, what my vision is and, um, and where we should go after, after 75 years. Uh, may I ask what are the member states member states that didn't respond? Is it something that we, you can? Sorry, say that again, Tana. Sorry. May I may I ask what are the member states that you reached out but you didn't receive a response? Yes. Um, I reached out to all member states, including Portugal. <laughs> um, I haven't received a response from them any, but I have to give Portugal uh, Vienna office credit that they did respond to my email and say that I can, I should reach out to the New York office, which I had. Um, most Why of the country, particularly Portugal, just because it's the incumbent country. And uh, I just wanted to That's say that right. I was respectful to all countries. Uh, so far, small states have responded and none of the Security Council members have responded mm -hmm. to my email. Um, have you ever considered what are the risks of your decision in the next steps the next chapters of your career in case you are not successful what's next have you thought um have you put any thinking of what so what i think my um next day yeah i think when i joined the un i um i had turned 30 and i had a professional career that was um quite successful um in few weeks of being here, I got hit by a cab. So I was in the ER, I had broken my leg, I had bleeding and bruising all over the left side of my body. I didn't know uh, the extent of internal damage. And I think in those moments I realized if I had died today, my biggest regret would not be uh, not having accumulated X number of professional tro trophies, not having done ABC or like, my guilt was that I hadn't contributed to the world in meaningful ways. Like, you know, at that time, my life had been all about myself, my goals. I would donate a little, volunteer a little, but not try to or take ownership of world problems and contribute in ways I know I'm capable of. Um, so that was my big regret that I think after that, so that accident, thankfully, like I recovered and um, that accident really shifted my perspective from self to selflessness. And I think for four years now, I don't really think about what's in it for me. I just know I'm here to serve. I, my time on earth is limited. Uh, I just want to make sure every day I'm serving people in any capacity. So more than my own future, I genuinely am worried about the future of refugees, displaced and stateless people who have been in lockdown for decades on end. This one year lockdown had been so stressful for us. Imagine being a Libyan in lockdown for 10 years, a Somalian for 30 years. Syrian for 10 years and now the situation in Myanmar. So I think I, I worry about them a lot more. I worry about the climate crisis a lot, like their rising sea level is causing displacement. In 20 years from now, we will not be talking about this election panels. We will be talking about where we'll be living. And at that time, the inequality will come through that those who have privileged and have financial resources will find a home, but others will not. I worry about those children who don't have internet or an opportunity to be educated. Um, so I think those are my big concerns more than my own career. And the biggest concerns for uh, 
the future of the world and also the future of our generation. Um, do you what do you going back turning back the 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 time when you were a child? Um, tell us a little bit more about what built your personality, what developed your personality, what are the um, what you received from your environment in your family, uh, in your school that affected your character today? What are the, those elements that you would distinguish from, from, the, from the childhood that you had? Um, I, I think um, my personality is definitely very influenced by my childhood and I had a very happy and loving childhood. Um, so I was born into a family of refugees. My grandparents were refugees. They couldn't, be edu they couldn't educate, uh, complete their education. Uh, so their goal was to educate their um, their children. So my parents are physicians. So I was um, I was born with um, with a lot of love around me. I was the first girl on my mother's side, on my maternal grandmother. So I was super pampered. My nickname is Guria, which means doll in Hindi. And back in my generation's time, we all had nicknames. And I think a lot of my family cousins might not even. I mean, I'm sure they know my first name, um, but. I'm always known as Guria, so it was a very happy childhood. We would go visit my grandma every weekend. Uh, my dad's mother, uh, like my paternal grandmother, um, twice a month. So it was. Um, so I think I had a very fun childhood. When we moved to Saudi, it was a lot of fun too. I was homeschooled. My dad was my teacher, so I definitely spent a lot of quality time with him. And I think that's where I get my sense of confidence from, because I was in an environment where I was encouraged to be who I am. I was encouraged to ask questions. I was encouraged to uh, to make decisions for myself. And then going into boarding school, that was like, you know, I mean, that was a totally different ball game. It was like, you know, nine suddenly becomes 18. You're doing everything for yourself. You have to manage your homework, your laundry, um, your pocket money too, and, um, and your meal time. If you oversleep, um, you probably won't get anything to eat. So that I think uh, really shifted my, uh, I think that made me an adult way sooner. Um, like I, I think to my memories before nine, I, I have like such fun memories after nine. I, I honestly can just think of like responsibilities. Um, what did I think your that family move from India to say Saudi Arabia? Yeah, sorry. What made your family to move? Uh, my, to a move? job opportunity. My mom, she got a job with Ministry of Health to work as OBGYN. So that was um, that was mm -hmm. what led to the move of the family and uh yeah so i think 9 to 18 was um was school and then canada was um canada was a refreshing experience for me as well because uh in boarding school you know you have four walls that you have to uh, you have to be under canada was like that open environment of college and i um and i think for me i was so happy that i was able to work my first job in canada and i know it's a random story but it was at tim hortons which is a coffee shop on it was a uh, on campus and at that time minimum wage was seven dollars and i was able to get a job for 750 and i was like oh my god i have arrived so, so that was 2005 and then i yeah 2005 and then when i graduated uh, my last job was 40 dollars an hour so i was like okay i, I think i've improved so um have you ever experienced in your adult life discrimination racist behaviors offensive behaviors in your career and if you can give us one or two examples if you if you ever experienced such behaviors and i would like also to hear what was your reaction how you try to manage the situation yeah i think it's interesting uh, being crazy in saudi also and um I hadn't experienced uh, sexist behavior in in Saudi as well. My experience with uh, with discriminatory behavior happened when I joined the UN. It's uh it's very unfortunate, but at the UN is where I have experienced discrimination uh, based on gender. Like most of the senior positions are held by male, so even when um, you go into meetings, you're specifically instructed don't talk. Uh, I will present everything. If you want to say anything, pass the note to me and I will say it. Uh, there's, um, there's no empowerment. Even if you do all the work, you're not even acknowledged. Um, and I think what's interesting is uh, 
so at the UN, um, one of my bosses actually told uh, someone that I should change my dressing sense because it's too nice and it's distracting for him. So, and, and I think that's when I felt it was so unsafe to be in that environment. Like, you know, to have to then face this person. And I remember calling HR and I said, this is, I, I feel really scared now, now going to work and what can I do? They said, well, you can talk to him. So I think just the lack of support, even as, as a female and, and have, being exposed to sexist uh, behavior is, is, not, is something that has shocked me. So I think, um, and I think this candidacy, I'm exposed to so much discriminatory behavior in general, where men make comments, she has no chance. And it's interesting that all those comments have come from men, even in pub. Um, this example that you just mentioned, can you share with us a little bit the feeling of, of the feeling that you had when you heard this, let's say, argument, which is not even an argument, but these phrases, how did it make you feel? Like, it was certainly shocking, I assume. But how, what was your reaction? Do you try to remember your feelings at that time? I think what's interesting is I'm realizing that this is uh, the second time I'm opening up about this. The first time I said that was during a clubhouse. So that means that the interview has a great interest. It's interesting for you and for me and for, for us because you know, what you just described to me, it's shocking for me, but I do want to know what was your feeling and your maturity at that age when it was four years ago. And what would you do differently today with your experience of these four, four years? I think what's interesting about some interviews is that you can't expect the questions and then it just, um, I can just tell you how I felt. Um, and I want to hear how you feel today about that, because certainly the feelings are different yeah. as you evaluate more and more. Um, I think the feeling at that time was shock, um, disgust, and a lot of fear. I think shock in the fit fact that I should change my dressing sense because it's distracting for a man. And uh, and this is my dressing sense. It's not that I, um, I, I wore any different dresses. So it was, um, and I think just it's interesting that how his temptation is my fault. Uh, and the fear of the system not supporting in any way. I, I had no one to turn to HR and then they said you can talk to him. Then there's a, a hotline for reporting and, and you talk to them and they're like, um, we can start an investigation, but we will have to talk to him. He will know. And then we cannot say anything about your job security. How I feel about it today, um, how I dealt with it, I, I just um, changed my office. At that time, I, I just um, couldn't do, I just, um, couldn't, um, I, none of the options would work to talk to him or to, to have an investigation. So for me, it was just good to find a different office. That was one. Um, how I would deal with it differently, I, I think within the confines of UN culture, I don't know. That is the system we're, we're left with. It's a system that doesn't support, that has all these policies, but that doesn't support anyone. You tell me, if someone is making sexist comments around about me like this, is my only option to talk to him? Is there no other way to, to resolve this? And, uh, and I think which goes back to the first thing, shouldn't there be manners? Shouldn't there be a teaching and education that you should not look at women as objects? Isn't that basic one-on-one -on -one, um, that, that men should know uh, that they're not, women are not objects, they are humans. I'm here to do my job, you're here to do your job and that should be our goal. Uh, so then I was, uh, in terms of, I don't know what to do differently. Like I said, over the years, this is the second time I'm opening up about it. And uh, and I think I've always tried to keep it inside and, and just- do you, feel, do you feel stronger today than what 
you were when you experienced this situation? I don't know if having gone through any form of sexist comment or any form of abusive um, comment like this makes you stronger. Because it, that's not just a sexist comment. It's a sexist comment combined and connected with an indirect threat that if you keep pushing for revealing and investigating these sexist comments, you put yourself into a professional uncertainty. So this is a, an indirect blackmailing. Yeah, there is absolutely that happens, yeah. At the UN, like it's, it's just normal. It even worse, the whole situation. Say that again, sorry, and I missed the last part. This makes the whole situation even worse, this indirect blackmailing about, you know, turning you down and trying to resolve it quietly. Otherwise, you are going to face potentially an uncertainty for your job. Did you share who were who were the first person you shared your experience? Was it your mother or any of your friends? No, I haven't shared this with anyone other than HR and the hot reviews online. And I think um, on Clubhouse, someone asked me this question and I'm realizing, uh, I don't know if it's a personality flaw or just who I am. It's hard for me to lie. So when you ask this question and you, you asked for an example, I, I gave in, um, but no. Would you be ready and I would say strong enough today from your experience that you've collected over the last four years to try to, to deal with the situation of what was happening four years ago? And if you would be elected at the end of the day, how would you manage these situations that are happening and what would you do to to put an end internally at the UN in terms of the policy changes that are needed and the cultural changes potentially? I think the first cultural change we need um, is respect for women as equal and not as objects. And that, I think, through my candidacy, I hope I'm able to shatter that thought in men's head that we are equal and we deserve a seat. So I think that's the first thing. And in terms of the policy decisions, I think um, we really do need to establish a policy where if a comment like this has, has been made, we cannot resolve to an investigation where that person will be contacted or a conversation with that person. We need another mechanism to hold them accountable to their words. I know in the private sector and in Hollywood, when the Me Too happened, like comp uh, like news outlets and stuff, they did cancel contracts with those who engaged in such behavior. And we need to do that to our leadership as well. We don't hold them accountable. There are complaints against sexual abuse, against leadership of the UN, and we reward them by promoting them instead of terminating. So I think these are conversations that um, and let me, say, let me say that the U.S., the way that the, U, the system in the U.S., like, for example, in the media organizations, when they notice these behaviors, they can cancel contracts and take bold yeah. actions. The U.S. set the, the standards, the high standards, because that's not the case in many countries around the world, including my country, Greece, you know, assume other countries, that there are no action, there is no action to deal with these cases. So your, so your question is that in UN there is no action? My question, my question, no, it's just a, 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 a comment that I've, yeah, I, I've been noticing. But yeah, thank you for sharing this, this experience with us. It's, it gives us a little bit of, you know, of what you've experienced through your life and your career and your experience at the UN. Um, my, my understanding is that you are passionate about what you're doing right now, about running for with for your candidacy. And I would like to know if this process of of your candidacy, do you expect that afterwards 
will change you as a personality to some extent. How does this process that you've been going through right now, and it is your decision to run and you support it and you are having a full passion for that, how this experience is changing Aurora in the process? And what do you think that you will be as a person once you know, either you are successful or you're not successful once, once this process is over? Um, I think in, in terms of how it's changing me is um, when I was preparing for my candidacy in 2019 and 2020, when I decided I wanted to run, I invested all the time in learning about the UN, like finishing up Columbia grad school, speaking to people who wrote great books in around late 40s, early 50s about the UN Charter, understanding what the intent of the Charter was when they called the Secretary General position Chief Administrative Officer. Um, and I thought that would be the kind of conversations we would have when I announced my candidacy. What should be the future of the UN? Why do we have 100 entities? Why do we have so many duplicated mandates? And the conversations that uh, are mostly, I'm, mostly I'm hearing are, why me? Like, you know, why my gender, why my age, why my experience? So it's, I think, I think the way, one thing that I didn't expect was the level of discrimination that exists in seeking a position. Like, we should be discussing about the UN that hasn't served anyone, that has no results to be proud of. And let's talk about changing it. Let's talk about reforming it. Let's talk about making a new UN. But no, the conversations are, why, why do we need a third, why is a 34-year-old running? So I think... Um, I realized that in society, there is a lot of work done to eliminate discrimination against women and youth in uh, international organizations and politics. And that's something that is, I'm very passionate about. Um, and it's, it's become a fuel for me going forward in my candidacy. Like before announcing my candidacy, the fuel was uh, the incident of seeing a child eat mud in Uganda. It was a devastating image. And then the response from a senior official to say mud is good for children, it has iron, like that filled me um, with so much disgust for that person to say like, you are leader of the UN and this is the level of apathy you have against those we're supposed to serve. And that always kept me during my low moments. Now what keeps me during my low moments is the fact that if I don't stand up for my generation, people who, who are reaping the benefits of my generation will never give us a chance. So I think it's um, breaking those glass ceilings for my gender and my generation and professionals all over. Why is it that professionals cannot become leaders? Professionals are the ones that sustain every organization in the world. In private sector, professionals end up becoming CEOs. Why is that not in international organizations? Why is it that my experience is demeaned just because it's not a title of a head of state? What is your aspiration for doing next after this process if you're not elected if you're not successful on this challenge what do you want to do next you want i haven't thought got uh i haven't thought that far to be honest my vision statement of a new un is due april 30th and that is keeping me up day and night working on it there are uh, a lot of people who have provided ideas we're compiling it together so i'm really thrilled at what lies ahead a UN that can serve governments, people, NGOs, and private sector, a UN that can really make a difference in the world is, I think, what's, um, what I'm excited and thrilled about. Before we conclude our conversation, because the time flies, and I would yes. have so many questions, but thank you for answering all these questions with honesty and directedness. What, are your, what is your advice to the young people who would like to pursue a career at the UN, who would like to apply for a job, um, to be part of the UN body and apply their professional experience in a position. What should they know before they apply and what should they know once they are accepted, admitted in a position? Do you know, it's interesting. I, I did Instagram lives with a couple people over, over this month and I asked them the same question. I asked them, what advice would you give to someone joining at the UN? So I'm going to steal their response, to be honest. 
Simone Filippini is on a, a Dutch ambassador. Augustin Maturi is a co my colleague at UN Environment Program. And they both said the same thing, which I think is fantastic advice for the exact question you asked. Why do you want to join the UN? What is that underlying force that's pushing you? Is it because you want to do, do great work in environment? Do you want to do great work in law? And once you answer that underlying um, reason, your motivation to making a difference, then there are so many roads that lead to Rome. There's no, not just that one road that leads to Rome. And, uh, and I think just exploring those avenues, um, instead of just saying, I want a job at the UN, it should be more like, what do I want to do with my life? With that being said, I will, of course, be, um, I, I would say two things. First of all, I definitely would request every young person to help me through this candidacy, because one thing that we really need to change is the average age of UN leadership is 62. We need to give, make sure that at least 25% of leadership positions are given to millennials and, and, and younger. Like we need to bring that diverse leadership, new ideas into, uh, into the UN and fresh perspective. We need UN to be the largest employer of young. You know, for far too long, we are expected to uh, contribute in only two ways, donation and advocacy. Like, but we need to ask that why are we not contributing in meaningful employment, employment ways? Um, and so that would be my one thing I would need help. In terms of just basic stuff, again, I would repeat what someone else said, keep applying and hopefully it will work out. But, uh, but I think it goes back to the basic question, what is it that you want to do? And there's so many roads that lead to Rome. Aurora, thank you very much for your time, for being with us today. Before we conclude the conversation, can you share a message that you would like to, to give to share to the audience of foreign journalists uh, watching you? Um, I think the message that I would want to leave a journalist with is that I fully understand the constraints that are posed on journalists um, and media outlets in terms of lack of resources. But I really want to urge that there are two sides to the UN. There's a decision-making body that is extensively covered and there's an implementation body that people don't talk about. And I really hope that as a um, that journalists take interest in that story as well, that what happens when a resolution is passed? What do we do with it? What are the results? And I think just to bring to light those stories that are not shared uh, due to lack of implementation of the UN. Good luck. And we are going to follow your next steps, your candidacy, and all the best. Be, remain resilient and strength. Thank you so much, Thanos. Honored. Thank you very much.